So good morning to everyone, everyone here as well as everyone online. Once again, we can say good morning to everybody online. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And we are very grateful to have you here with us at Sangha Yoga Church. Uh, Sangha is located here in Kansas City, Missouri. We do this every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, my beautiful wife, who you all met in my video last week, teaches the yoga portion, and then this is my opportunity to share with you um, what is called the Dharma talk. Dharma simply means purpose. I believe that our purpose is love, and I also believe that it is very difficult to practice our purpose. And so every week what I try to do is to encourage you and to inspire you to do that, while at the same time trying to remember myself. <laughs> So we're continuing to talk about this concept of mindfulness. And as I shared with you before, this came up actually because I was asked to do a conference for a group of high school and elementary and middle school principals about mindfulness. And that just thrilled me because the opportunity to teach meditation to school principals was just wonderful. So I created this concept of mindful using it as a seven-step process, each of the uh, letters being an acronym for a word. So we start with M, which means, say it for so everybody online can hear it. Meditate. Meditate, exactly. Meditate. You can meditate or you can medicate. <laughs> but either way, you need to do something. <laughs> If I could teach one thing to people, it would be meditation. I get more of a thrill, I'll be honest with you, people come up and say, I heard you talk and I started meditating, than when someone completes the 21-day complaint-free challenge, which can take eight months. Because I have seen how meditation changes us. And I forget who the great... Um, uh, a pianist was, but someone interviewed him about uh, his performance at Carnegie Hall and they asked him how often he, he practiced and he said every day. He said, because if I don't practice one day, I notice. He says, if I don't practice two days, the audience notices. And the same thing is true I find for meditation. If I don't meditate one day, I notice. If I don't meditate two days, everybody else notices. <laughs> so if you'd like everybody else to stop noticing you quite so much, or to notice you in a better way, then we should do the M in, medita in mindful, which is what? Meditate. Meditate. The I in mindful stands for? Indians. Indians. This is that concept of beginning to look at people who are actively trying to bring you down as sacred clowns. This is a true concept in Native American culture that every Native American culture has a sacred clown whose job is there to upset you as much as possible so you'll become less upsettable. <laughs> this is true. Now what we think in our Western mindset, Puritan-based culture is that anyone who upsets us should be ostracized or killed <laughs> instead of embraced as a divine spirit there to help us work off our rough edges. So to become mindful, we should meditate, we should practice the I, which stands for? Indian. What does the N stand for? <laughs> Now, now, Yogi Berra was asked, what time is it? And he said, do you mean now? We are so often somewhere else. We're living in the past. We're living in the future. We can be doing something that we have looked forward to doing for months. And we can miss it because we're aggravated about something that happened yesterday. It's crazy. And we have that. And becoming more in the now is a skill that we have to learn. There's no pill. There's no waking up one day and all of a sudden you're mindful unless you, I guess, have a lobotomy or something. I don't think it's possible. It is something we practice through mindful walking. Meditation increases this. Mindful sitting, known as Zazen. And what we talked about last week, which is my personal favorite, mindful hugging. And Marty and I continue to practice our mindful hugging. So the M stands for? Oh, y'all are so excited this morning. I can tell. One more time, the N stands for? Thank you. The I stands for? The N stands for? The D stands for? Dual. 
duel. You have not one mind, but two minds. You have a divine, loving mind, and you have an ego. As it was said in the Four Agreements, Don Miguel Ruiz says that you have a mind that is like an angry wolf that wants to devour you, and you have a mind that is like a blessed, beautiful, noble wolf that wants to guide you. And the answer as to which one wins is whichever one you feed. So you have to actively feed the loving side of yourself. The F in mindful we talked about last week. It stands for? Forgive. Forgive. Forgiveness is not a vaccination. You don't forgive your parents. You constantly forgive your parents. You constantly forgive yourself. It is an ongoing practice that we must do, but we cannot be mindful, that is, live in ourselves and in the moment, if we're carrying baggage from before. So, we've covered five. Today we're going to cover our sixth before we do our seventh next week, and the U in mindful stands for? Understand. Understand. This is very much akin to forgive. Because if we understand the motivations, we'll see that rarely is there as much to forgive as we thought. The challenge is, we don't want to understand. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you, let's be honest. We don't want to understand because then we might have to admit the other person's right. And that would make us... Oh my gosh, the ego can't stand that. The ego cannot stand being wrong. So we do not want to understand other people. It is an anathema to our makeup in our ego, dual-centered minds. So what do we have to do? Do it anyway. We have to do it anyway. One of my favorite movies of all time is Being There with Peter Sellers. Does anybody remember that movie? Raise your hand. Good. Yeah. Both all of us that were here when the earth was cooling. Um, the movie is an amazing movie. Peter Sellers was also famous for, and really famous for, thank you, The Pink Panther, before Steve Martin. Peter Sellers actually began the role. But in this particular movie, he plays the, I would say, what you might call today an autistic person. But there was really not that definition quite so much back then. But he is the illegitimate son of a billionaire in New York who doesn't want anyone to know that he has a son. And so the young man grows, to, a young boy grows to be a man living in this penthouse apartment in New York and he literally never leaves. His entire life is watching television and being in this apartment. The billionaire, his father, dies. And because he does not want any record of the son, there's no idea of who's going to take care of him. And so literally, in his 50s, he's turned out on the street, wearing his father's very expensive suit and carrying his father's very expensive briefcase. Now the interesting thing is, and I will spoil the movie, by the end of the movie he is the front runner for the presidency of the United States. <laughs> this happens in a very plausible manner because through a number of odd happenstances he ends up meeting some powerful people and again he has had no interaction with other people other than what he sees on television. And right before he is turned out, he's watching a television show of two businessmen meeting, and they shake hands. So he's doing this. And one of them says, I understand, Thomas. And he goes, I understand, Thomas. So he's turned loose. And as he goes out on the street, pretty much all he does is go up to people and when they talk to him, he shakes their hand, looks them in the eye and says, what? And people are like, oh, he understands. I would ask you to raise your hand if you'd like to be understood, but it would be, a, it would be silly, wouldn't it? 
because I'd worry about the person who doesn't want to be understood. We all want desperately to be understood. It is a basic human need of ours. And as Stephen Covey wrote in the seven highlights of, of habits of highly effective people, the fifth habit of highly successful people is they seek first to understand before they are understood. So much easier said than done. Because we go through our lives. One of the things that I do when I do my corporate speaking is I'm always talking about complaining. That's the, the main thing people hire me to talk about. And I always talk about there's, a, there's an element of how dare this happen to me in every complaint. And my joke is how dare this happen to the center of the universe. <laughs> go ahead and laugh. Because they laugh too. You know why? You really feel that way. And you're wrong. Because I am. <laughs> At least from my perspective, we all feel that way. It's what keeps us alive. It, is, it goes back to our ancestry. During Jesus Christ's time, you had a one in three shot of being killed by another person. One in three. Today it's one in tens of thousands. And yet we still go around with, I have to look at the world through my perspective. I have to be careful. I cannot trust. I have to be very careful. I have to, it's all about me. That's self-preservation. I want you to consider self-mastery. Self-mastery is when we begin to open our minds and go, wow, there are other people. And they've got their stuff too. 2,300 years ago, Plato said, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Now I will ask you to raise your hand. If you're experiencing a problem right now, raise your hand. Hold them up high, please. It's okay if you don't have a problem right now. There's one waiting on you. <laughs> Look around the room. Now, if we turned off the camera and if we started talking and you started sharing your problems with us, we would see you very differently. We would see you more compassionately. Covey tells a wonderful story as he opens the seven Hi habits of highly effective people of a man sitting on a subway train. And as he's trying to get home from a hard day's work, there are two children climbing over the plastic seats on the subway and literally climbing over him and screaming and jumping around. And the worst part is these children's father is sitting right there and allowing all of it to happen. Finally, the man leans over to the father and he said, would you please control your damn kids? <laughs> and the father looks up like he just woke up from a dream and he said, I'm so sorry. I, we just left the hospital. Their, their mother died suddenly. and I guess I don't know how to handle it and they don't either. Do you think he saw them a little differently after that? Mm -hmm. Do you think he saw the children differently like that? Mm -hmm. The problem is, as Covey says, most of us do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. Mm -hmm. Let me say that about 15 more times. <laughs> we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. We try to get the minimal amount of information so that we can say the smartest possible thing. And again, we all do it. But self-mastery is not doing that. Self-mastery is being a blank canvas upon which the person speaking writes. Covey calls it autobiographical listening. How is this going to 
impact my life story? Or how can my life story impact what is being said? It's all about my autobiography, even when we're listening to other people. And I have to tell you, I noticed this the other day. When I was speaking in Phoenix, I went to dinner with some really, really impressive people, people you would say pretty impressive. I mean, this one man I I went to dinner with, he, um, (laughs) he owned 52 houses outright before he graduated college, starting with nothing. I know. He is a, he owns 87 companies now. Many of them produce well into the seven figures. He is 53 years old, and he has 7% body fat, and he's a bodybuilder. So as we are sitting there at dinner, as George Goebel said the night that he appeared on the Johnny Carson show with Dean Martin and several other major stars, he said, the world is a tuxedo, and I'm a pair of brown shoes. (laughs) All of a sudden, I felt like a pair of brown shoes at the table. And my ego kicked in and started going, tell them how impressive you are. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, tell them how cool you are. Add to something. Find something to say for crying out loud. Someone is outdoing you. At what? At being himself? He has problems right now possibly bigger and worse than what I have. He deserves my compassion and not my envy and certainly not my competition. And the same is true for everyone. Understanding is basically compassion. One of my favorite quotes is from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. (laughs) Because here's the thing. I asked you all to raise your hand if you have a problem, right? We all raised our hand, right? Actually, you didn't because we all know you do have a problem. We all have problems. Every last one of us has problems. Do those problems bother us or irritate us somewhat? Say yes or no. Yes, right? Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't it be cool if those problems did not? Right? Yes or no? Yes, okay? The thing about them is, if we focus on them, they're going to bother us more, right? It's like the old joke about the guy who goes to the doctor and says, my elbow hurts all the time and it's bugging me, so the doctor stomps his foot so he won't notice the elbow, okay? We're always noticing the elbow. We're always noticing the problem. One of the greatest things we can do is when we're with someone is to shift it and to think, What sort of a pain are they going through? What sort of a problem are they going through? What sort of a challenge are they going through? What is their issue? And you can't then focus on the elbow and the foot at the same time. You begin to focus on the other person's pain. This is why people who go out and spend their lives, like Mother Teresa, and I was reading about a a Wall Street investment banker who left now, and he actually lives in in one of the... Uh, eight uh, areas that she built a hospital. And this man went from making hundreds of millions of dollars a year to literally making nothing but nursing dying people. He said, I did it because I'm happy. Because I'm focusing on other people. Because I'm understanding. The word compassion is defined as a keen awareness of the suffering of another coupled with a desire to see it relieved. Now, I know this sounds a little kindergarten, but I want you to read that out loud because I want you to remember it. One, two, three. A keen awareness of the suffering of another coupled with a desire to see it relieved. You know what I love about that? It says coupled with a desire to see it relieved, not coupled with an intention to see it relieved. You don't take on the other person's burden. You acknowledge that it's there and you support him or her there. Compassion is a keen awareness of the suffering of another coupled with a desire to see it relieved. An intention to change that person 
so that they get better is not compassion, that's codependence. And that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> Remember that everyone you meet is carrying a hard burden. And may I also invite you to remember and don't discount your own burden. Oh, I shouldn't let this bother me. Anybody else could handle this better than me. Nobody else would let this bother them. The person you need to give the most compassion to, a keenest awareness of your suffering, coupled with a desire to see it relieved, is the person you see in the mirror. Because once you have compassion for yourself, and only when you have compassion for yourself can you give it to other people. You can't give away something you don't have for crying out loud. So you have to begin first by being compassionate with yourself to understand that you're a formula. You've been beat up and bruised. Your record's been scratched. Parts of you have been hurt along the way. And that leaves an imprint. And it's okay. Eckhart Tolle in a New Earth talks about how the people who upset you, if you could go back and live their lives exactly as they have lived their lives up to that point, you would be the exact same person they are. We give compassion to ourselves when we understand that we suffer. I heard a really interesting uh, talk yesterday. It was like a TED talk on Audible, and it was about a woman who is a scientist, and she went out looking to what makes us happy, what makes us confident. Because happiness and confidence, by the way, are proportional. You can't have one without the other. What she discovered, and this actually made her depressed, and she had to go to a therapist. <laughs> the answer is vulnerability. The answer is willing to be an imperfect mess yourself. It doesn't mean being a jerk because you are an imperfect mess. It means giving yourself some slack because you are an imperfect mess and you always will be and you're not going to become more lovable when you get rid of the imperfections. You love yourself and then the imperfections don't matter so much and then you can carry that understanding to others. So commit this week to having compassion for that mess that is you so you can begin to understand others. Take somebody's hand. Let's close in prayer. So infinite spirit, we celebrate the old saying that there's only one of us here just in seven billion different bodies. We give thanks for what every one of those people bring to us. We give thanks for our opportunity to bring things to them. And one of the things that they teach us is that our lives are not nearly as important as we'd like to think. There is equal suffering all around us. And as we turn our focus on that, we relieve our own suffering and we make other people feel happy, loved, and connected in the process. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.